We're just missing uh, one panelist who is, uh, who's on our way, but uh, I'll get started. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Stewart, and I'm from Nexicom, uh, AS11666. Uh, we're a service provider and regional transit provider uh, based in Ontario. My role within Nexicom is that of a global peering coordinator, and I'm also a senior network architect uh, in our operations group. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I am also uh, the Secretary for the Board of Directors for the Toronto Internet Exchange. A significant part of my role uh, in our small organization uh, is building, evaluating and maintaining peering relationships at public exchange points. Um, we currently belong to three Canadian peering exchanges, eight U.S. exchanges and one European peering exchange. We average approximately 74% of all of our traffic is done through some form of peering. We are constantly evaluating traffic levels between networks looking for better ways to push the bits. This of course includes additional peering locations where value proposition and possible performance gains are the two largest considerations taken into account. Canada is the second largest country in the world and has a population of approximately 34 million people. Of those 34 million, it's important to note where Canadians live. 75% of Canadians live within 160 kilometers, or 100 miles, of the U.S. border, according to most public estimates. So it's no surprise that the largest metro regions are Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver with just those three regions having a combined population of 11.7 million people. In Canada, the largest internet traffic levels come from the dominant providers, the incumbent telephone companies and the cable companies. This is nothing overly unique to Canada. Examples of these large providers include TELUS, Shaw, Bell Canada, Bell Alliant, Eastlink, Kojiko, Videotron, and Rogers. There are over 350 internet providers in Canada, according to CanadianISP.ca, which is a website that allows consumers to search for uh, a potential service provider in their area. When these 350 or so internet service providers want to exchange traffic with other providers, where and how do they do this today? I find this to be an interesting question with typically three answers. Internet exchange points using public peering, private peering, of course, or upstream via their transit providers. In a lot of areas of Canada, your options for upstream transit providers are limited to one or sometimes two options. It is only in the heavily populated cities where many transit providers start to emerge as options. The most common of these cities that come to my mind, again, are Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. There are many other cities that have options, but those three have the most options. If you're not near one of these major cities in Canada, you have the option to transport your traffic to those locations at a considerable cost, or to purchase local transit options. But what about peering? Where do Canadian service providers do settlement-free public peering? What about U.S. and international networks that want to come to Canada and exchange their traffic as well? When I take a look at data in Peering DB and search for Canadian exchange points, a list of 12 possible IXPs came up. If I filter those results down a little further by removing the possibly dormant exchange points or those that sometimes only have one or two peers on them, I really end up with four or possibly six IXPs. I'll explain. 
The Toronto Internet Exchange, known as Torix, is definitely the largest IXP with approximately 156 participants and peak traffic levels of over 70 gigabits per second currently. It's also Canada's oldest IXP, having been established since around 1998. Equinix has one peering exchange in Canada, located in Toronto as well. Equinix Toronto has approximately 11 participants. Greater Toronto International Internet Exchange, GTIIX, is relatively new and launched around March 2011. It has approximately seven participants. Ottawa Internet Exchange, known as Audix, has approximately seven participants and peak levels of around 200 megabits per second. It was established back in 2001. That's the four exchange points that I'm able to confirm, but you remember I said possibly six. The other two exchange points are Kix and Vantix, if you will. Kix, or Quebec Internet Exchange, has approximately 12 participants in Montreal. Information about this exchange point is a little bit vague, however, I understand they're still pushing traffic. If anyone has any information on Kix, please come up to the microphone later and, and share your, uh, your details. VanTX Van is the BC Net Vancouver Transit Exchange. Up until recently, I'll admit I'd never heard of this exchange. Appearing DB shows zero participants. However, I did exchange some brief emails with their staff and was told that while they're primarily a research and education network, they do operate public peering exchange points with active participants. Their website is quite informative on their offerings and their staff are very fast to respond to the inquiries. I do believe that some of their staff are here in attendance as well. The purpose of my lengthy introduction was to hopefully share a few key elements about Canada. The geography is quite large and diverse. The state of California has more population than all of Canada. And we have a limited number of active peering points today. And we make the best beer in the world. <laughs> I had to add that in there. Now, <laughs> got me thinking about beer, it's only noon. Now it's pleasure, my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Patrick Gilmore is Chief Network Architect at Akamai Technologies, where he has worked for over eight years. He currently oversees the Network Architecture Department. Patrick is also Vice Chair at Lynx, Vice Chair at, of Peering DB, on the board of SIX, and on the board of NANOG. Sylvie, hi. Sylvie Leperrier serves as the Chair of the Board of Directors for NANOG. At Google, Sylvie is on the Program Management Team, building out the internet connectivity and content distribution reach required to deliver Google services worldwide. John Nister has been the president of the Toronto Internet Exchange for the past two years and has been assisting Torix in various capacities for over the last 10 years. Bill Reed, sorry, um, is one of the founders of the Manitoba Internet Exchange. The organization of MBIX started in the fall of 2011 and the plan is to be up and running this summer. MBIX will be the first IX that will receive support as part of CIRA's project to increase the number of IXs in Canada. CIRA is the Canadian Internet Registration Authority and oversees all the .ca domain names. Victor Kersing is the network architect, there you are, sorry, um, for Rogers Communications, leading the introduction of new technologies along with steering the wireline, wireless and business networks. In his role, he also contributes to the IETF and cable labs, helping bring operator focus to those bodies. I'd like to extend a big thank you um, for these folks agreeing to participate. The main focus of this peering panel today is to explore the current state of public peering options in Canada. I have seven specific questions to ask these panelists, and then I would like to open it up to the audience for any feedback. These questions are those that I get asked on a regular basis by other providers, and in some cases, consumers themselves. So it seemed prudent to ask our panel of experts their opinions on these questions. My first question for the panelists, some Canadians share a concern, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Some Canadians share a concern around the amount of Canadian destined traffic that loops into the US and back. I did a really brief survey of the Big Five, a name commonly associated with the lar five largest banks in Canada. From my home intercon interconnection in Ontario, I did a trace route out to these five banks. Of course, this isn't 100% conclusive and only one viewpoint. But I found it interesting that my potential banking traffic went out to Chicago and came back to various points in Canada for three out of five of those banks. My questions for the panelists is, do you believe that this concern is valid if your personal banking traffic or other sensitive information goes to another country or through another country? Do you find this concerning? And do you believe that potentially more appearing options in Canada would alleviate um, the concerns that these folks have, or is it just a la lack of peering in Canada? Who's up first? Ladies. Ladies first? Okay. <laughs> yes? Okay. So when I thought about this question, I can answer it in many ways. First off, as, um, as a citizen of Canada, I was thinking, wow, this seemed wrong. Why is my data going somewhere else? Then I thought, as a networker, I should have asked myself that question. Maybe I should have done some trace routes myself, but it never occurred to me. And I wondered, why is that? I do trust my bank to do what's best. So I do trust that they have um, a networking team that is protecting my data. We do have a lot of laws protecting confidential information, especially financial information. So it didn't seem to be a big problem for me. As a networker though, I think we're always better served as consumers when the data does not travel long distances. So I would encourage my banks to look at alternatives. Thank you, Sylvie. John? So Sylvie's first mistake is trusting a bank. <laughs> but to her concern, you know, as a resident as well, why would my traffic have to leave even the Toronto area? But then it just dawned on me, I'll use an example, TD Bank is very popular in the Boston area. So this sort of begs the question, do Americans now have to come up to Canada to do their banking? Um, so it is quite interesting. It is a valid concern. Um, you know, if I were to ask my mother the same question, she would probably would have no idea. Um, would she care? She would definitely question why it has to happen. Um, to the second point, um, do you believe that there's potentially, uh, sorry, was there more peering options within Canada to alleviate the issue? I would say it would, it would alleviate part of the problem, uh, but then ends up spurring up other problems. Uh, Victor? So, I mean, I guess as a citizen, I kind of care if my banking traffic goes through the U.S. or not. Um, probably prefer that it didn't. Um, but I see it, you know, from an operator perspective, I see it as more just uh, efficiency. I mean, the banking traffic's from some, you know, some amount of traffic I might care about it. But when we start talking about other types of traffic, which might become uh, more indicative of the future, I start to get more concerned about how efficiently are we moving bits across and can I be more efficient by having more local peering that I can offload things in Canada as opposed to shipping it all the way down to the US. Uh, Bill? Well, I don't have much to add, but, but um, my point is, is, is basically the, the efficiency, you know, obviously the, um, Sylvie um, said it exactly. Uh, you don't want your data traveling all over the place just, just to get next door. Um, but um, the networks are very dynamic, so even if you did check and see, you know, whether uh, it was very difficult to even check with content deliveries and everything else, you, you, uh, CDN networks, it's very hard to determine exactly where your data is flowing. So, And the, and the things that are important, like financial data, are, are encrypted, so theoretically it's, there's no security issue as such. And uh, Patrick, maybe from an 
opposite perspective here, the U.S. traffic coming to Canada? So uh, there's two things to worry about here. The first one is, um, as a consumer, I look at my banking data and I want to know if it should travel across uh, a geopolitical boundary and what that means to the laws, the whatever. I mean, I'm sure Canadians are worried about the Patriot Act or the Americans are worried about, you know, some guy on a horse trying to run down our data. But um, whether that whether that happens or not, whether it's encrypted or not, that's a little beyond the scope of what I can think about. Uh, the efficiency that Sylvia and many others brought up is very important to me as a networker. Unfortunately, I don't necessarily think that it is the most efficient thing to always peer at the closest place, right? If we have uh, two banks in uh, two towns that are 100 miles from each other inside of Canada and it takes 200 miles to get to the U.S. and back, but the amount of traffic between the two cities is 5% of the total, it could very easily be more efficient total to go through the United States. Remember, we're all for-profit businesses, I mean, to a first approximation. I'm sure there's some educational institutions and whatnot out there, but in general, ISPs are for-profit businesses. And we want to make money, and to make money, that means sometimes doing things that may look in a small scope as suboptimal, but in the larger scope will increase the bottom line. So going through the U.S., if there's lots of fiber that's cheap in, going in that direction, may be more efficient than going across you know, the frozen tundra when it's expensive and you have to dig or something. Thank you. <clears throat> so earlier I mentioned eight of the larger providers in Canada, just using examples, and using pub publicly available looking glasses, I took a look at these eight providers to get a feel for how many of them peer with one another, or if they purchase transit from one another. My interest here lied in how the traffic flows between these uh, eight large providers. Roughly speaking, and definitely not conclusive by any means, about 50% of them communicate directly with one another. The number was actually higher than what I anticipated. The remaining 50% of these eight large providers go through a transit provider to communicate with others. A bit of a political question, and one that gets asked sometimes, is do you feel that governments should look at imposing requirements for large telecoms, cable companies, to connect to IXPs locally in their region and if so, those larger companies should provide reasonable peering guidelines for interconnection. It's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, John. <laughs> okay. Um, should the government get involved? Probably not. Um, a, a brief discussion earlier uh, today uh, sort of regarding this whole thing. There's... Anytime the government's involved with stuff, it seems to either drag on for an extremely long time or doesn't get sorted out the way that's maybe in the best interest of how people want to see it. Um, in the case of IXs, if you were to have the government regulate uh, telecoms or other providers to connect to IXs, they may start doing other tricks to avoid putting traffic there. So at the end of the day, you could end up with less traffic uh, than initially started. Uh, Sylvie? Oops. I really don't think governments should impose um, peering, um, peering as a mandatory thing. I've, I've said many, many times and many years ago and haven't changed my mind about this. I think peering is a commercial decision. It's very easy technically to peer. What prevents people from peering is their commercial and their business plan. And like Patrick was saying, everybody has a business plan and every ISP, every content provider has a business plan. And you have to trust them to do the right decision for their network. So, and we do also have uh, examples in the world where governments have imposed um, IXPs and presence and mandatory peering and they're not successful. So what we want is the peering point to be alive and well, and to be alive and well, you have to let the ISPs and the content provider and whomever joins the exchange to do exactly the commercial arrangement that they want to do. Thank you. Uh, Victor. So I'll have to probably concur with the last few folks here. Um, I don't personally think that you would probably get the uh, right outcome if the government was to try to craft a way of doing this. Um, I find that the you know notion that you know if it's a, there's a commercial benefit to doing it, if it serves a customer base, 
um, you know, people's overall experiences improve by do, um, having uh, more pairing, that that should be the driver to doing it. Unfortunately, like mentioned as well, um, there are various commercial processes and various companies that kind of limit the ability to do this, and hopefully we can get past that because, um, you know, I think there's a lot of benefits to being able to have better established pairing across the Canadian operators. Excellent. Patrick? I should point out that I speak for myself, not for my employer, who is apparently CBC now. But anyway, um, sorry, Akamai. Uh, speaking for myself only, um, the idea that the government imposed peering is a really bad idea. Uh, all it will do is make a lot of networks exit Canada. Um, so uh, I encourage everyone to not do that. And Bill? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I agree uh, that uh, it's probably not a good idea. The, in Canada, with the CRTC and the telcos, um, a lot of the orders for, for cooperation have not been all that successful because a company, if it doesn't want to cooperate, can always think of ways to make life difficult. Um, I'd be more interested in the government themselves um, in, in Manitoba. I'd be very happy for the government of Manitoba to appear with RIX itself. Uh, you know, I'd be happy. That would be a good step forward. And um, if there's a business case for, for ISPs to, to appear, well, then fair enough. Thank you. Given the uh, large geography of Canada, which I've talked about, and taking into consideration the uh, limited number of IXPs, um, I'd like to ask each of the panelists if they believe that this affects uh, content delivery networks in their ability to effectively deliver the content. Patrick. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was told to keep my answer short, sorry. Uh, Many content delivery networks are happy to put on net nodes inside of networks, so the lack of uh, a strong peering base in many places is uh, not a complete and utter um, inability for us to deliver uh, content locally. There are obviously um, lower limits. You can't put uh, nodes in every single ISP, no matter how small they are. So um, IXs that can aggregate many small ISPs into something that is large enough to um, you know, require a, a node, a dedicated node for that IX is useful. But um, the lack of those uh, IXs um, either means that there's not enough small ISPs because otherwise one would grow organically, or that there are enough large ISPs, in which case you can just put nodes on them. Uh, is that a better, more complete answer? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sylvie? Um, I will draw a parallel here to the US. In the US, we have nine large peering metros. In Canada, there's three large peering metros, and nine large peering metros for 10 times the population in the US seems to have done the trick. Um, yes, but those three large peering metros are Seattle, Chicago, and New York, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that content, content delivery networks have other means than just peering, so by deploying caches in a network, you're effectively going much deeper than a peering point, and that is what drives benefits to end users because you're much more closer to them than if you just leave your traffic at the door of the peering point. So it won't it won't um, um, prevent uh, CDNs from deploying. Uh, the the lack of IXPs or the lack of peering point won't be an impediment to deploy CDN networks. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Um, well, Patrick and, and um, Silly uh, answered the question. Um, but what uh, uh, I said, um, we're just starting an IX in Manitoba. And uh, we are, um, we'll be installing an Akima server and a Google Cache server. Uh, of course, the transit are not being supported by Akama or, or Google, but um, these cache servers will be very beneficial to the local community and to the peers. So I think that's the, 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 the approach you can, you can do. And, you know, so the cache servers are still useful, it's just that the CDN are, are not actually um, 
you know, appearing at the, uh, the IX. Uh, Victor? I mean, I think the CDM provider is going to be able to, I mean, whether they brute force or not, they're going to be able to provide to their customer base, you know, whether or not there's more or less exchanges. I mean, I don't want to overuse the word efficiency, but, you know, maybe there's better ways of doing it. I, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of, you know, third-party CDNs or CDNs that I don't own and control. Um, so I've been, if I look at it, you know, in the future from our own contents perspective and how I'd like that to flow to customer bases, I mean, I would say it's my personal opinion that I think there's some benefits to be had there. Um, the one thing I try to do, um, I'm supposed to be a new technology guy, is I try not to use my old way of thinking to define what's the best way of doing something moving forward. So I, I, I do agree there's a lot of established ways and practices to do things, and you know we've gotten pretty good at how we do things in the past, but I don't want to limit our ability, now kind of putting the future hat on, on uh, you know moving this thing with their speech forward by consistently trying to figure out, well, if it's worked in the past, that obviously means it'll work in the future. So I'm always open to trying to figure out, is there better ways, more efficient ways of doing it? And one last little example there is, you know, um, there's the whole, I, I figure maybe people don't care about this, uh, the green thing. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to just use less electricity, you know, less resources to be able to effectively deliver the same amount of service to the same amount of people. Excellent. John? Uh, so one thing to touch on is that, at least from, and I'll use some Torx examples, over the past little while, we've had a lot of peers come in from very remote areas in Canada through layer two circuits to be able to pick up some of these content providers. So one way or another, those bits are gonna get there, whether it's through these layer two circuits that come through, or they end up picking up transit through somebody else. So I don't think it'll, uh, answer essentially is no. <clears throat> so World, IPv6, World IPv6 Day uh, is coming up very shortly, as we know. This is a major milestone for content providers and, and eyeball networks, in my opinion. Um, there have been some transit providers that will provide free IPv6 transit if you're at a common IXP with them. And there are also some large peers that have restrictive policies on IPv4 peering uh, but for IPv6, they're very open uh, to peering even with small networks. So my question is, uh, in your opinion, uh, do IXPs contribute towards IPv6 awareness and adoption? And I'll start with Bill, please. Yeah, I, I assume they will. In, in our case, though, um, an IXP actually goes a long way to um, encouraging um, acquiring an ASN and, and, and VGP knowledge and just the whole process of hearing. Uh, a lot of the big big organizations in uh, Winnipeg don't have, a, don't have ASNs. And, um, so, you know, so I think it, the, the, an IX goes towards improving in the smaller areas, improving the knowledge of networking entirely, and an IPv6, of course. Uh, Victor? This is actually a loaded question. Um, I probably go way off topic on this one. Um, whether IXPs help, I mean, I guess some of these practices have helped, although I think at this point, and I could be wrong, maybe they're, you know, is that on the operator side, on the, you know, the, the folks in this room, I think the ISP, oh, sorry, the IPv6 issue is well understood and the need to move towards it. I mean, there's varied opinions there. And, um, but you know, I think IPv6 adoption has some, has some other barriers. Hopefully in the next couple of days, some of those will be lifted and the excuses are removed and we can kind of move forward. Um, but like I said, it's had some contribution. It did, did, in the earlier days, it did have some people asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. so I just found it took a long time to get the whole operator community to finally realize, you know, we gotta, gotta kind of figure this one out. Um, and on the enterprise side, but I guess that's not directly related to the IXP, so. Excellent. It's a kind of non-answer. <laughs> John? I think IX as a whole, uh, now this is obviously from my viewpoint, but from a, from a Torx perspective at least, we try to encourage our peers to reach out to other peers to get their VSEX connectivity flowing. Um, in a lot of cases, there's many people that don't know how to, or where to start necessarily or how to get it set up. Uh, so we generally tell them, you know, fire it up, 
We'll send them a couple sites to at least get started with it or get a better understanding of it and suggest to them who they can reach out to locally uh, to be able to start doing some testing amongst each other and whatever else. Like even all of our welcome package stuff that goes out to peers always includes V6 information because we try to push our peers to, once they connect, do their V4 and do their V6 at the same time so they don't have to worry about it later on. Uh, Sylvie? I'm not sure that it would spur the adoption of V6 or not. I think people, well, first off, I hope you're all deploying IPv6. I mean, really, this is the second or third IPv6 day. So if you're not on with the program, get started. It's going to implode in your face otherwise. So I don't know that an IXP would be a motivator. I think the motivation has to come from your own network and that you do believe that this is the best path. So I'm not sure an IXP has a, a, a role to play there, uh, but it certainly doesn't hurt. I mean, it, it's a good way to test it out and test your peering policies and test your maps. So why not? But I don't think it'd be like a Yay, we can push V6 for this. <laughs> um, Patrick. So I get this question actually quite a few times because I'm you know, involved with a few internet exchanges. I think that the answer is that an internet exchange has a nice role to play um, because the participants you know, talk to each other and so you can lob the idea out there. But reality is that everybody who's um, got enough clue to attach to an internet exchange better already have enough clue to do v6. And they better have enough clue to have already done v6. We all know that's not the truth. And unfortunately, I don't think that the people at the internet exchange are going to change that much. It's not like Torx or Lynx or JPEX is going to say, oh, well, you should do v6. And the ISP is going to go, oh, well, what was I thinking? I'll do v6 now. Um, it also, as Sylvie says, had a, has a nice role because you can you know, enable it on a peering router, not the rest of your backbone network, set up some sessions, get some idea about it. So there is some small use, utility there, but reality is that uh, you guys have to do it and the exchange is not going to either help you or be able to um, push you to do it. It's got to be down into your own networks with your own business cases for your own customers for your own reasons. Good answers. Thank you. <clears throat> When we uh, look at the known um, active peering points in Canada, um, there's no IXP in, let's say, Calgary, Alberta, just as an example. There are several internet providers uh, in the Calgary area, so you could conclude that those providers might benefit from having an IXP. So my question is, is why do you believe cities such as Calgary do not have an IXP today? Is it for lack of interest from those providers? funding, knowledge, um, why isn't there one there today? Uh, Sylvie, please. Um, so if we look at the model of um, opening up an IXP, what, makes an, what, what are the conditions that you need to have a successful ISP? Um, first off, I think you need a critical mass. So there, there needs to be sufficient networks in the area that do want to interconnect. Secondly, you need to have fiber diversity. You need to make sure that there's, there's more than one provider going to a location. Every network has their favorite providers and when you give them the choice to extend their backbone to a location and they can do so using their providers, they will generally find a business case to do so. So when there is critical mass of providers, uh, of, of networks, and when there's also more than two uh, fiber providers, I think you start getting the conditions. I would also say that what you need to have a very strong IXP is you, you need people like you. You need members. You need people that will make it work. Um, I think the IXPs have had an amazing role in um, expanding the internet. I can think of the Seattle Exchange and the Toronto Exchange that are all member-based and volunteers are powering uh, the IXPs. And that makes um, 
a, a nugget of collaboration in a city, and I think that's important. So if the value of an IXP is to make us all work together, I think it has a lot of value. So I would add that, and, um, and it, uh, it, it's also a way to collaborate too, uh, to make sure that we, we get closer to users. Um, so those would be the conditions to open up. So the reason is why Calgary not, um, I don't know. But I would go back again and say, do I have a business case to join an IX in Calgary or not? And to make my business case, I need to make sure that I will connect to a sufficient number of peers and that I can do so cost, cost effectively using, uh, by extending my network to that area. Uh, Patrick. So as I was just saying uh, a little while ago, whenever somebody says, why does something happen or does something not happen? The answer is money. We're all for-profit businesses. Um, if you're sitting in Calgary, uh, you clearly have to have a line to somewhere else, whether it's Vancouver, Toronto, Chicago, Seattle, somewhere to get to the internet in general. You may not need a line to the building next door where your competitor is. And even if you buy that line, even if it's very, very cheap, even if um, you could peer with your competitor, which is not at all guaranteed because you know some people don't like to peer with their competitors, um, if only one megabit of traffic is going between the two of them, there's no business incentive. So summary is really just what Sylvia was trying to say and more importantly just does it make business sense. If it makes business sense, if there is a compelling business reason, you know, if it's just break even or if it's closed, somebody might overlook it, but if there were a strong incentive, if somebody could make a lot more money, increase their bottom line, there would be an exchange. Since there isn't that strong evidence, not proof, but strong evidence that there is no business case there. Maybe we can change that business case by having somebody like Google or Akamai or somebody show up and say, hey, we'll pair with everybody. Will everybody now come? Because it changes the business case. But at the moment, there's clearly not one for the ISPs in Calgary to do it themselves. Thank you. Uh, John. Calgary. <laughs> OK. Um, Calgary could have up to 50 ISPs. Um, the first question that comes to mind is, what central location is there in Calgary to put something like an IXP at? Um, a lot of people may have some reservations regarding connecting to an ISP that isn't in a neutral location. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is one of my previous statements with layer two circuits. Um, it is cheaper to get a layer two circuit to Toronto than it is in some cases to go across the street in Calgary. So in a lot of cases, people may just run connections elsewhere um, do I think there's a lack of knowledge? Not necessarily. You can always turn around and ask somebody for some assistance or reach out to the other IXs and see how they're doing stuff. In terms of a funding model, if, if there were maybe a neutral location, you know, Torque started off with the switch in the back of a beat up Honda, so I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a, uh, a concern. I remember that Honda. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to open the mics up in just a few minutes, just so I don't keep you standing there too long. Okay, thanks, uh, Victor. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's kind of beaten the Calgary horse down, but yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a lack of interest. I think there's a lot of operators who probably, well, if, if they can make it, com if it's commercially viable, they, they might try to do it. Again, I think based on how some of the content providers have spoken, I mean, there might be some challenge there to figure out what the what the viability of having an IXP out there might be. Um, you know, like John mentioned, I mean, it, right now a lot of people make the, the business case is really about cost of circuits and building up fibers. Maybe hopefully in the future the business case will include other factors that are currently not taken into account, um, which include, you know, maybe operators making or content, you know, people who put content on the content providers, CDNs, they make it part of that, the deal. And, you know, if you're going to have my content, I want you to have the, certain types of. Um, you know, assurance quality, or quality of assurance, et cetera. So hopefully that might uh, be factored in the future. Yep. Excellent. And uh, Bill. Well, Cal Calgary, Alberta has has a, a network called SuperNet, which uh, is mostly research, but an education, but it also has um, it's open to to businesses as well. That may satisfy a lot of the needs for for an IX. I don't know. I really don't don't know. In Manitoba, which is somewhat smaller than Alberta, 
um, is difficult to start an IX because of the, of the points that Sylvie and, and Patrick have, have said. It, it's very hard to get that, you know, that critical mass. It's really, really hard. Um, particularly when the, um, the dominant um, ISPs, uh, the cable companies and the telcos, are, are, don't seem to be all that interested in, 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 in uh, joining an IX. So I think it's really difficult. It's a tough slog. <clears throat> Thank you. So taking the Calgary example a little bit further, um, of course this can be applied to several locations in Canada. Um, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, known as CIRA, um, has announced on their website that they've engaged in an organization called Nordicity. The purpose of engaging Nordicity is to have them build a business case for potential development of Canadian IXPs in different regional areas. While the study is still ongoing, um, this raises several key questions uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, the ever going question is, do we need more Canadian IXP points? And if so, what city or cities are, are appealing? Um, given in that some of these identified cities, there's no IXP today, um, it's safe to assume that there was no business case previously, or do we feel that nobody has built a good business case to date? Uh, John. It would be beneficial to have more. Um, in terms of locations, I would probably say Montreal and Vancouver out of the two. And the reason I say that is there's likely more pull from other international companies, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or overseas, to land in those locations simply from a variety standpoint. Um, in terms of a business case, maybe there is a business case kicking around, but maybe there aren't actually any people available in those cities to start running one of these exchanges. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't do it remotely, but sometimes you need a couple local people to kick it off. Uh, Victor? Again, I'm probably in line with, with Nister there. Uh, John Nister, sorry. I call him Nister. Um, is that I think Vancouver and Montreal are probably pretty good locations. Um, they're big metropolitan areas. Um, it's probably likely easier to build a business case around that. Um, there's a lot of local talent in those areas to help uh, work the exchanges and uh, help out with that. So I, I think those are probably good places to have. And you know, especially on the Vancouver side of things, it really helps us because you know, we talked about the whole 10 to 1 ratio of population, but we have slightly different drivers in Canada than it's in the U.S. But it's not just about density of population, it's about dispersion of population. So it would be nice to be able to, set, you know, satisfy the needs of, for example, those in the west, you know, west coast or out in the west side of Canada, you know, um, and looking at some other factors other, um, because of distance. So we still have a distance challenge in Canada. Yeah. So I think that plays a bit of why Vancouver might be a good selection as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sylvie, please. I definitely want a peering exchange in Montreal because that's my backyard. I think it would be great. Um, I also think that uh, as, a, as network planners, you can look, you can, you can consider Canada as a diverse, diverse path for your traffic. If you look at city pairs, you can easily take Montreal, New York, Toronto, Chicago, and Vancouver, Seattle as pairs, and you can deploy a redundant path for your network when you do, when you do the, the Northern Corridor. Um, the former network uh, that employed me, Tata Communications, had that plan, and it was um, really, really useful when there was a, an event, a networking event, or I can think of a brownout in the Midwest at one time. So it, it, you, you, you can take, I, I would look beyond the boundary and say this is North America and look at your network and you can look at your fiber routes and, and make that determination. Uh, in terms of Having a sustainable exchange, yeah, I think Montreal does have a lot. Uh, it's really close to, to New York, and it's also well served by um, European networks. Uh, so it would be a good um, a good location, and Vancouver as well, um, considering uh, Asian networks and also diversity. 
Uh, I think diversity as we grow the internet is really important. We should all think of losing a metro. What happens if we lose a metro? Where does that traffic go? Very good. Uh, Patrick. Well, my geography sucks to begin with, so I'm sitting up here looking at a map of Canada. Uh, and I'm going, hmm, Edmonton, they have a... We have a hockey team in Edmonton, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, so that must be a big city, right? I mean, is that, isn't that how it works? I mean, we do NFL cities in the US, you guys do hockey cities. I'm just, uh, but back in reality land, um, truth of the matter is, I don't care how many people are in a city, I don't care um, how many people, uh, you know, how many fiber paths or whatever. What we're looking for is, um, I, I hate to bang on this drum again, but I'm looking for money, right? I'm looking for a way to make me rich. I'm looking for a way to increase the bottom line and improve EPS, whatever else you want to call it. And that is loosely but not per, uh, not perfectly related to bits. So we look at places like uh, Toronto. If Toronto is well served by the Torx, then okay, I don't need one there. If Montreal is well served by New York and is a peering point, and there's not a lot of advantage. I don't get performance. I don't increase my, you know, I get no new customers. I can't lower my transit bills. There's, uh, you know, the, the long lines are not that cheap or something like that. Then I don't really care about that. And I look at Edmonton, which is a much smaller city than Montreal, but perhaps the network costs are much higher to reach there. Those are the kind of things that I look at. And everybody in this room should understand exactly how peering works or you know most of you should understand how peering works and the rest of you hopefully are trying to you know get there it's a business decision i want to make money so while it's fun to look at where the hockey teams are and it's entertaining um it doesn't help me increase my eps and that's really what i'm trying to do so look at performance look at long haul costs look at you know what will get more customers more dollars in savings revenue etc and then do that and unfortunately, I don't know enough about Canada to answer that question. So maybe it's Manitoba, maybe it's Newfoundland, although they have a half hour time zone, so I don't like to talk about them. Um, maybe it's Edmonton, I don't know. Thank you. And uh, Bill. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it is hard. In uh, Manitoba, um, being right in the center of Canada, uh, when we do trace routes of, of various traffic, um, often the, the, the traffic's will, the, the, the packets will go to Calgary, Toronto, and then to Winnipeg, or sometimes they end up going to the States, and then Toronto, whatever. Um, and uh, so most traffic in, in Manitoba, when they go between ISPs, they travel a long, quite a long distance, and it's not, it's not necessarily that they're even peered together, it seems. So there was quite a bit of interest in creating a, an IX in, in Manitoba, but it was mostly among the smaller ISPs. And, um, and so we had, back in the fall, we, we, we had uh, three or four uh, ISPs that were interested, and we have about half a dozen that, that are interested. Um, clearly, we, we don't have enough traffic um, to encourage Acoma or Google or anybody else to content delivery to actually come into Manitoba. We're only a million people and of that, uh, only a few hundred thousand perhaps are, are actually would be, eyeballs would be in, on the um, IX. Uh, but, the, you know, to set up an IX is not that much money and so we were going ahead with it. Um, very fortunately, quite a coincidence, CIRA had decided for their own reasons um, that uh, they would like to see if it was possible to increase the number of IXs in, in Canada. And, um, you know, we got talking and very fortunately, as I say, we were right at the point of, of impl implementing it and Sarah said, well, how about if we use the Manitoba Internet Exchange as a test case for seeing if we can develop uh, an IX in an area which is um, too small to really warrant a, 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 an obvious business case. So, um, Sierra, we're very happy to, to be working with Sierra. Sierra is like a brand, so it gives some credibility to the IX and might encourage um, companies to, to join it. Um, Sierra, uh, what Sierra has done is they're going to be putting um, at the IX, they're going to be putting a, a .ca a root server and uh, uh, an L root 
a DOT server and a NTP server. And they also are going to be paying the transit for uh, an Akama cache and I think we're, uh, Google cache as well. So right away you have um, some reasons for um, ISPs, smaller ISPs to, to join, the, um, join the IX. So we'll see if that's enough to get a, us a critical mass um, and you know, time will tell. But so far, we're, we're very, very pleased with uh, Sira's uh, involvement. Great. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, I've got a, a seventh question here, and I'm just going to pick up the pace a little bit because I, I know some people want to come up and ask questions. Um, I'm just going to ask one of the panelists this question, if that's okay. Um, content providers and eyeball networks are always looking at connecting a new IXPs. I realize that's a very blanket statement. Uh, but let's, let's assume that that's true for a moment. So when evaluating potential IXPs, um, what are the common challenges you see and do you see any challenges in Canada that are unique to other locations in the world? Um, Sylvia, I think that'd be a great question for you. You do? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I was distracted by the colorful map. Can you repeat? <laughs> I was thinking this is great for Patrick. I was going to give him a, a test after and ask him where Nunavut was. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I'm not listening. It will be okay. Um, so, uh, when evaluating IXPs, um, what are the common challenges you see and are any of those challenges in Canada unique compared to other parts of the world? Hmm. It's a good question. Eh? What's unique? It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I guess. I cooling down the gear won't be a problem. Um, that's not even true. Um, you know, co-location, power, space, well, um, finding places to put. You know, the IXPs are where, you know, attractive things, if attractive there's a new Attractive things IXP. is neutrality, for sure. So, uh, neutral location, neutral providers of fiber, uh, those are really important to set up a successful ISP. Nobody likes to feel captive of one network. Um, so, you do, you do need to pick your building carefully when you set up an IX. Um, also, I would say cheap power is becoming the order of the day. Um, we all know that transit costs are declining, bandwidth costs are declining, but one thing that is steadily increasing is energy cost. So um, energy uh, cost in Canada is actually very low, so it would be a differentiator and it would be helpful to set up a business case. So, thank you. You can go back to the map now. Yeah. So um, I would like to open it up to the uh, microphones here. It looks like we've got just under 10 minutes um, so the audience can ask a question. I just have one quick question for the group as people are coming up to the microphones. And it's kind of a bit of a, a loaded question, but please put up your hand if you actively peer in Canada quite a number. And out of that number, how many of you are not on Torix for peering? Ooh. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll be talking soon. <laughs> um, let's start over here, please. Hi, my name is Jean-Francois and I happen to be from Calgary. So I'm with uh, Cybera, the research network for the province, and I'm actively looking at starting up an IXP. Uh, we're at early phase right now looking at where we could actually locate it. So I'll be, uh, I'd like to have a chat with uh, uh, Bill and uh, uh, a bit later and, and see if we can uh, exchange ideas. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. Jim Bloomberg. Um, I should probably use the most appropriate affiliation, which is Torex. I'm on the board, um, a bunch of other companies. Um, very early on, you discussed uh, government uh, regulation in regards to IXPs. 
Um, and you know what I thought of was uh, what's going on in Quebec because there is some form of regulation in Quebec. But I'd actually like to flip it around and ask, sometimes regulation is bad, but incentivization is good. We have all of these funds in Canada in regards to deferral accounts towards, you know, uh, putting internet, putting telephone and communications up north, etc. Um, would incentivization be a better way of doing it rather than regulation, or is that just this, uh, you know, the, the the same dog with different lipstick? Uh, no, if you're going to pay me, I'll do lots of things I wouldn't do if you didn't pay me. And everybody, stop the jokes that are in your head right now. <laughs> Anybody else? Just picking up on your question, I would say that incentivization should be definitely to provide internet connectivity to rural areas or remote area. It is a very large country. And as you, as you leave the band of 100 miles or 160 kilometers, um, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to provide internet services, so you rely a lot on satellite um, or wireless. Uh, and those are typically networks that are a little more expensive to build. So I would, if I, if I had like a government hat, I would save my money program for that type of access. I think when you think of an exchange, um, it's easy for people to make a business case to join an exchange, and, and that should be, it should stand on its own. Um, if, otherwise, if you incentivize and you create an exchange and it doesn't stand on its own other than by government grant or funding, it will die because people won't join it. You'll have an initial uptake and then it will just dwindle into oblivion. That's my personal opinion. It doesn't reflect that of my employer or anybody else. Thank you. So just to uh, quickly touch on that, I think from an incentive perspective, if there's any type of government hand in the thing, they're going to want some type of um, say in some of it. Um, I do a lot of work in northern Ontario, and uh, they still have party lines up there. So I'm not really sure that getting internet to some of them would even matter because they just don't, you know, they're fine without it. Anybody else have a comment on that? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, Paul is a guy that uh, tagged me. I'm with Nordicity Group, and we're doing this study of the Canadian Axe piece. So, Jean Francois and others, if you are interested in setting up uh, Canadian Axe piece, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, just a quick question Do commercial grade standards make a difference in terms of attracting people or not? And should those be written into some sort of SLOs or anything else? Or are they really a discouragement um, in terms of bringing in new peers? Commercial grade standards are always nice. You don't want a fly by night place. But realize that the most, the largest internet exchanges in the world are typically have no SLA. You know, they're typically member based. They don't give any money back if they go down and things like that. So the members want it to be professionally run, they want it to be stable. But we're not looking for a telco style uh, SLA um, in general. I think um, the internet is built on what we, we called best effort. Uh, but we have to be realistic. And best effort is pretty much golden. Uh, I don't know of any ISPs that don't have five nines or um, really bad uptime or packet loss. Everybody is vying for the same customers, and best effort is really golden. So um, I don't think SLAs would make any difference. I think everybody in the room here wants to build good networks. And they won't they won't settle for a lesser quality. So we just that's the way we build it. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Ken Bloomberg again. Um, so in the one thing I saw that uh, is different about Canada is that in the U.S. a mom and pop ISP probably starts at fifty million dollars of revenue, and that's considered mom and pop. 
In Canada, we have number, because of the regulatory framework, etc., we have a number of smaller ISPs, half million, one million, five million dollars in revenue. Lots of pockets of ISPs where you might only have five or three ISPs in a town in the US, you might have 50 or 100 like in Montreal. There are probably over 100 ISPs in Montreal that don't connect to an IXP today because the cost to get Toronto, as an example, is too much. But if there was one in Montreal or Vancouver, you'd have all of these smaller players suddenly connecting. Um, is, is that an accurate difference between the US and Canada in terms of um, the network uh, makeups that there are lots, lot more smaller providers um, compared to the U.S. Well, obviously, if there are more providers, then it's clearly a difference, right? I mean, it's, I think the question is a little tautological. Hi, we have more providers. Is that different than the U.S., where you have fewer providers? Um, <clears throat> the answer is kind of yes. Would it matter? Does that mean that you should have exchanges? That's up to the smaller providers. Um, you know, it's it. Peering is not free, as we've said for years and years. So if you have somebody with half a million dollars worth of revenue, and it costs him five grand to you know, go to the building, bring up a, a quarter rack, buy the equipment, and set up peering, is that worth it to him? Or it, will he only save five megabits of transit, which costs him you know, 10 bucks a month? I, I, I can't answer the question whether it's useful or not, because I don't know enough about the smaller providers. It's up to them. And if they do, or if they think that it would be useful to have somebody like Google or Akamai or you know, anybody else out there to come and peer with them, all they have to do is email us. We are more than happy to discuss it with them. But I can tell you right now, if one guy emails us and says, hi, we'd like to set up an exchange, and it's one small provider with one small amount of peering traffic, the answer is going to be no. You've got to get them together. So talk to each other. You have ISP associations. You can do it. Hmm. A. <laughs> I've been so careful not to say that the whole time I've been up here. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, uh, Ron Grant, uh, Skyway West uh, here in Vancouver. And uh, because no one from Pier 1 is standing up to correct the misconception, uh, uh, I have to uh, point out that there is a internet exchange uh, point in Vancouver called PIX. <coughs> and there's, what, 15 uh, uh, members, and of which we're one. Uh, there's an Akamai and Limelight uh, connection uh, to it, and um, lots of big providers there, and it does very well. So, um, you know, you can join us. T Technically, Thanks. there's a PIX in Toronto and Montreal as well, but we have not seen any type of update at all from sort of the Pier 1 side of the house. But, you know, if so, there's anybody from Pier um, 1, it definitely would be nice to hear more about it. And I do believe that... So first of all, I know that Akamai doesn't have a router in Vancouver, uh, but apparently that exchange is connected to the Seattle Internet Exchange. Is that correct, Mike? Yeah. I, so I'm I'm 99% certain, you know, having being in charge of Akamai's peering stuff, that we don't have a router in Vancouver. But if it is attached to the Seattle Internet Exchange, that's great, and you know, you can peer with lots, a lot more than 15 people there. So. Sorry, I should have mentioned we also have a, and the same, you know, in the same, uh, the, the sixth uh, connection is in our connection at, uh, at Harbor Center. So, yes, there is a, an extension to the six uh, in Vancouver as well. Thank you. We're just running out of time, so just one more quick question here, please. Yeah, it's going to be quick. Uh, Blake Crosby from CBC. Um, how successful are Canadian internet exchanges compared to the rest of the world? Uh, the rest of the world is vastly different, right? So you have things like M6 and Lynx and DKX, which have terabits of traffic. Um, I was I was looking at stuff like all Equinix exchanges around the world are um, less than a single, um, tra less than the total traffic of M6 by itself, uh, literally. So would you consider Equinix not successful? Yes or no? I mean, it's it's hard to say. What is the metric of success? Number of peers, number of routes, number of megabits, whatever. The Toronto Internet Exchange is smaller than almost every, you know, major exchange in uh, the U.S., but I would not consider it, uh, I wouldn't even begin to consider it unsuccessful. It's very successful. I, uh, I, but the rest of Canada, I would, I would consider Toronto to be, honestly, the only, quote-unquote, successful exchange. I think the, there's a somewhat an evolution for your network as well. When you start peering on an, an IX, at one point in time you do make a determination that it could be too much traffic on the public fabric and you prefer to, pri to privately peer with another network. And uh, again, that's why the neutrality of the site 
and the abundance of, of fiber providers to help you do those private connections later on is important. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Blake. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're kind of running really out of time. They're going to throw something at me soon, but you have a quick question? Very quick. Just a point of clarification. When you guys are talking about the terabits per second of peering traffic, that's very often the public traffic that you can see. So when Patrick says, you know, these guys are these big terabit per second exchanges, that's public peering fabrics. Other facilities like in Equinix, for example, would have an enormous amount of traffic going privately between parties that you cannot see. So it's very difficult to compare the two. Um, the private peering is by definition not exchange traffic. You know, 111.8 has a lot of private peering. If you take, you know, the exchanges out of it, it the point is, yes, there's lots of buildings with lots of private uh, connectivity. The question was, are the exchanges successful? And, and I would say the, and the internet exchange generally consists of both public and private peering that goes on. So and I would, see, I would disagree with that because if you take Equinix and PAX out of the loop, if you look at, you know, Lynx has a private, um, private peering product, but M6, DKIX, Torx, Six, JPEX, etc., do not. They don't own the buildings. They don't own the facilities. They are not in any way related to the private peering. So no, the exchange is the exchange, and private peering is private peering. Now it's perfectly valid to say that one is useful and the other is also useful, but they are separate. I would just close by saying I, I disagree. I think the public and private peering collectively is what makes the exchange valuable, whether you use one or both or a hybrid. Anyway, let's go. Cool. Thank you. All right. I think we're out of uh, we're out of time here, folks. Sorry to uh, cut you off. Um, I'd just like to thank the panelists uh, first and foremost for participating, and uh, thank the audience for their feedback and participation as always. Thanks again. We made it up for like five minutes here. Just well done. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just on the programming notes, we reconvene at uh, 2.30 after lunch. Uh, there is a um, meeting, an open meeting uh, that so for feedback with uh, some of the folks from the board and the uh, program committee that's going to take place just on the other side of the back wall in the open seating area. Uh, if you're interested in giving feedback on the things that were discussed at the community meeting yesterday. Thanks.